Hi, my name is Shanali Mitta. I'm one of the multiple myeloma physicians here at Dana-Farber, and I'm an instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm here today to talk about symptom management in multiple myeloma. So as we know, both multiple myeloma disease as well as its therapies can cause a host of symptoms, side effects, um, and things that will affect your day-to-day -day living. Um, and this is something that um, has definitely evolved over time. And the reason I bring that up is, as you can see here, there's a small built bottle of uh, Coca-Cola syrup. One of the first clinical trials run in multiple myeloma was looking at the use of urethane um, versus Coca-Cola syrup as a placebo. And actually Coca-Cola syrup um, improved outcomes, probably because it was treating some nausea at the time. Um, but this is why it's important to understand multiple myeloma therapy, to understand why we do clinical trials, as well as to um, understand how multiple myeloma, the disease or its treatments can cause certain side effects and how best to treat them. So multiple myeloma itself, um, when it's diagnosed, can be asymptomatic. Um, however, a number of the end organ effects of the disease can also cause a variety of symptoms. Um, typically, the criteria that we look at for diagnosing active multiple myeloma include these factors seen here on the, uh, the right, including an elevated calcium level, anemia or a low red blood cell count, kidney dysfunction, or bone lytic lesions. The way we treat multiple myeloma has also changed vastly over the last few decades, incorporating several different types of treatments or combinations of treatments that in can include immune modulatory drugs, proteasome inhibitors, um, cellular therapies or novel immune therapies, and typical chemotherapies um, that we divide into anthracycline or alkylating agents as two possible classes. Um, as well as a, a common medication used along with multiple myeloma treatment, um, which would be steroids. Now, both of these things, whether it's the myeloma itself or the therapies, can cause a significant number of issues. Um, most commonly, uh, we see fatigue, um, and this can be a, a function of low blood counts or anemia, um, a function of the disease outside of the blood counts, um, or even a side effect of the therapies that we use. Similar to that, shortness of breath, um, which can be again seen with low blood counts or low red blood cell counts specifically. Easy bruising or bleeding that can be from low platelet counts or effects of the myeloma on the coagulation cascade that affect how our body forms clots. Um, obviously bone pain and pathologic fractures um, as a side effect from bone lytic lesions that are commonly seen with multiple myeloma, either at diagnosis or um, within the treatment course. And then things like constipation or confusion, very commonly seen with a high calcium level um, and uh, uh, can be easily treated. And then moving on to some of how the therapies can cause uh, side effects. They can also cause fatigue. Um, they can cause both diarrhea or constipation depending on the um, drug class that we're referring to. They can cause a rash or skin changes. Um, and most worrisome obviously is the disease itself or medications that can compromise the immune system leading to an increased risk of infections, as well as the medications causing um, blood clots, uh, cardiac or lung dysfunction, um, and then again, the disease itself or therapies that can cause peripheral neuropathy. So in the next couple of slides, we're gonna go over some of the specific classes of medications that we use commonly in multiple myeloma and the side effects that they can present with. To start with, we'll start with the IMIDs. Um, the immune modulatory drugs, we more commonly use lenalidomide or pomalidomide in the U.S. Thalidomide is more commonly used in Europe. Um, but a common side effect across all these um, images that we see is obviously myelosuppression or suppression of the bone marrow uh, activity, which can present with a low white blood cell count, a low neutrophil count, which are the cells that help fight infection or neutropenia, as you see listed here. Um, anemia being a low red blood cell count, or thrombocytopenia being a low platelet count, the cells that help with clotting. 
These drugs could also increase the risk of blood clots. That's why in most cases we recommend patients be on a um, at least a baby aspirin daily, if not a blood thinner, depending on uh, medical comorbidities. Um, some of them can cause cardiopulmonary side effects, whether it's a effect on the heart rate um, or uh, lung function itself. And then very commonly we see um, fatigue or weakness with this drug class. Um, we also include renal side effects here because uh, these are medications that are cleared from the system by the kidneys. So definitely something to keep in mind if there's any kidney dysfunction. Um, and then in terms of GI side effects can cause diarrhea or constipation, more commonly diarrhea in most of these medications, um, which can be managed uh, outpatient in most cases. And then lastly, um, this drug class can also cause uh, skin findings such as a rash. Most of the times can be treated with topical or um, over-the-counter regimens. Thalidomide, which um, we don't use as commonly here, can also cause peripheral neuropathy. But that brings us to our proteasome inhibitors or the MIBs, bortezomib, carfilzomib, exosomib, um, which can commonly cause peripheral neuropathy as well. Um, this is a side effect that we can see as a result of multiple myeloma itself or of the treatment um, and uh, something that is important to discuss early on. Separately from that, um, what's unique about this drug class in regards to um, bortezomib, which is one of our first generation proteasome inhibitors, along with peripheral neuropathy, it can also cause low blood counts, a low platelet count specifically or thrombocytopenia can sometimes cause uh, hypotension, um, very commonly causes fatigue, and then can also occasionally cause GI side effects such as nausea, vomiting, uh, or diarrhea. Um, carfilzomib is a little bit unique within this drug class. Um, in addition to the side effects we mentioned for bortezomib, um, it tends to have a slightly lower risk of peripheral neuropathy um, however, it does have a slightly elevated risk of cardiopulmonary side effects, which can present as an elevated blood pressure, um, an elevated heart rate or an abnormal heart rhythm, which can sometimes present as a feeling of palpitation, shortness of breath, um, headaches, and so uh, or lower extremities, swelling um, in the feet or the legs. And so definitely something to keep an eye out for. And then lastly, there's exosomib, which very similar to bortezomib can also cause low blood counts, fatigue, um, and GI side effects. A newer drug class are the monoclonal antibodies, or uh, the MABs for short. They include daratumumab, uh, isotuximab, and elotuzumab. Both daratumumab and isotuximab target uh, at a CD38. A protein on the cell surface of myeloma cells um, to facilitate killing of the myeloma cells. And elotuzumab targets a, a different target known as SLAMF7. Um, a common side effect that we see with the monoclonal antibodies is an infusion-related reaction. Um, this is basically um, a allergic-type reaction that can occur um, at the time of infusion or subcutaneous injection. It's more common with um, the first one to two cycles, and that risk of a reaction actually falls uh, significantly after that. And so with these medications, um, along with the first uh, administration, we generally provide medications prior or pre-medications to prevent this side effect, such as Benadryl or Tylenol. And if an infusion-related reaction is seen, um, we can either slow down the rate if it's being given IV um, or give additional medications to treat the reaction, whether that be further Benadryl or steroids or other supportive medications. Um, that infusion-related reaction generally presents, like I said, similar to an allergic reaction with hives, skin findings, itching, um, can present with a fever, chills, um, and if more severe, chest pain or difficulty breathing. Um, very commonly with this class of medications, we also see drops in the blood counts, specifically in the white blood cell count, um, or the cells that help fight infections, presenting as neutropenia, 
um, anemia or thrombocytopenia. Um, again, they uh, can very commonly cause fatigue. Um, and then less likely, but something we always keep an eye out for is also the risk of GI side effects such as diarrhea or nausea. Um, now I've included a couple classes of medications here, the antibody drug conjugates, um, the one of which was previously on the market, which is Belantamab, Mapidotin, and then HAC inhibitors such as Panabinostat. Um, these are no longer um, commercially available, however, are um, in some instances um, available on clinical trials still or in combinations. Um, and so we won't focus too much time on this today, but they do have a unique set of side effects in regards to the antibody drug conjugate, philantamine, mapidotin. Um, it, in addition to causing low blood counts um, and occasionally um, some GI side effect, it can very commonly cause ocular toxicity, uh, which can prevent, which can present as um, swelling of the uh, lining of the eye um, or scarring of that area. It is reversible, so um, and it is something that even on clinical trials requires close monitoring prior to every dose, um, and so that's something that would be discussed at that time. And then lastly here, we also have um, Selenexor. Um, this is a medication um, that targets a pathway in myeloma to um, affect the transport of protein across the cell. Um, and um, is a, a, common, a medication that's commonly given uh, with steroids or medications like pomalidomide or Velcade, bortezomib. Um, it can commonly cause, again, low blood counts, fatigue, um, and uh, GI toxicities, which can present as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, decreased appetite. Um, and this is something that needs to be closely monitored with cell next or specifically, um, commonly treated with uh, using medications to prevent these side effects um, to get ahead of it, and then using as needed medications to treat additional uh, GI discomfort. Moving on to some of the more um, uh, both novel and uh, chemotherapy regimens here. Um, in regards to the typical chemotherapies that we think about, uh, there's the anthracyclines, including doxorubicin, um, or the alkylating agents, which can encompass cyclophosphamide or melphalan. Um, so to start with uh, the anthracyclines, uh, while doxorubicin is not commonly used up front as much in the myeloma setting, it still is a valuable chemotherapy, um, especially in very aggressive cases or things like plasma cell leukemia that we see it used. Um, similar to other chemotherapies, it can cause low blood counts, does cause um, GI discomfort, whether that be diarrhea, nausea, um, vomiting, or constipation. Um, again, uh, typically managed with preventative medications or prophylactic medications to avoid these side effects. Um, and then as needed medications to treat them if they should occur. Um, and then one thing to um, especially watch with um, doxorubicin, uh, less so with the liposomal uh, formulation, but also can cause um, cardiac side effects above a certain lifetime dose. Um, and so something to keep an eye out for. Similarly, we have the alkylating agents another type of chemotherapy, um, which encompass cyclophosphamide and melphalan. Um, these can be used um, either in the upfront or the relapsed refractory setting in multiple myeloma. Um, and uh, depending on uh, kidney function, it might have some dose modifications. In regards to side effects for this class of drug, again, it can cause bone marrow suppression, which can lead to low blood counts, a low red blood cell count, a low white blood cell count, or low platelet counts. Um, again, can also increase the risk of infection because of those low white blood cell counts. Um, commonly cause fatigue um, and weakness. Can also cause some nausea, vomiting, um, diarrhea. In the case of melphalan, can cause mucositis as well. Um, although much of this is dose dependent, um, and so uh, if used in the upfront or um, in the relapse setting, 
Um, the risk is a little bit less of those side effects. Malplan, which we commonly use as consolidation prior to an autologous stem cell transplant, um, when given at a higher dose, tends to cause more of these side effects along with the typical um, fatigue, weakness, weakness, and alopecia or hair loss. And then moving on to the novel therapies, we now have um, the novel immune therapies that include CAR-T therapy or bispecific agents. So CAR-T therapy is the use of re-engineered T cells to target a myeloma. Um, there's two that are currently FDA approved, Carvicti, which we uh, refer to as Silta cell, uh, or Abecma, um, which is Ida cell, are two CAR-T products that both target the BCMA antigen on myeloma cells. Um, and they cause unique side effects um, that are somewhat similar to other T cell engaging therapies. So the other side of that is bispecific T cell engagers or bite therapies. Currently the only FDA approved uh, bite therapy is Tecvalli or Teplistamab. This is a antibody that targets both BCMA, which is a antigen on the myeloma cell, as well as CD3, which targets the T cell um, to allow or to facilitate uh, killing of the myeloma cell. Because of the way these medications work, the common side effect that we see is cytokine release syndrome or CRS for short. And this is a activation of the immune system um, with these therapies that can present as fever, uh, low blood pressure, um, low oxygen levels, a high heart rate, um, among others, including fatigue, um, feeling malaise or feeling very tired um, or flu-like symptoms. Um, and this is generally managed if it occurs more so um, on the inpatient side um, with Tylenol or other supportive measures. Um, this class of medications can also cause something called neurotoxicity. Um, sometimes we refer to it as ICANs or immune cellular associated neurotoxicity. Um, and that can present as confusion, uh, tremors, headaches, um, or even be as severe as seizures or a comatose-like state. Um, and we'll discuss management of this um, moving forward. Both of these therapies as well can affect um, the bone marrow activity. And so that can present as, again, low blood counts or low red blood cell count, anemia, a low white blood, white blood cell count, myelosuppression, or um, increased risk of infections as well. So one of the most common drug classes we use in multiple myeloma therapy both up front and in the relapse refractory setting, often in combination with other therapies is steroids. Um, and dexamethasone or other steroids um, such as prednisone or prednisolone are still considered the backbone of multiple myeloma therapy. And as helpful as they are to the therapy, they also cause a wide range of side effects, as you can see here, affecting pretty much almost every um, organ group. So we can see um, most commonly, uh, mood changes, insomnia, difficulty sleeping, um, increased activity, uh, followed by periods of uh, decreased activity when the steroids wear off. Um, it can lead to weight gain, appetite increase, um, increased blood sugar or um, hyperglycemia, increased blood pressure, hypertension um, within the um, endocrine organs, it can, uh, like we mentioned, e increase the blood sugar levels, it can cause um, adrenal side effects or change the function of the adrenal glands. Um, it can cause um, blurred vision or worsen cataracts if that should exist. Um, in terms of some of the cardiovascular side effects, it can cause lower extremity swelling. Um, it's very commonly causes GI side effects such as most commonly heartburn or uh, acid reflux. Um, it can worsen peptic ulcer disease, change taste. Um, steroids can also cause uh, several skin findings um, similar to acne or, or comedones. It can cause thinning of the skin, which in can increase uh, bruising um, or bleeding. 
And then long-term can also cause effects on the muscle strength. Um, it can cause breakdown of muscle groups, um, which can present as weakness generally of the uh, larger muscle groups first, so the thighs and difficulty standing or getting upstairs it can cause muscle cramping. Long-term use can also lead to um, decreased uh, white blood cell count, the risk of infection over time um, and decreased bone density. So as you can see, this can definitely affect a wide range of, of organs uh, groups. Um, and so there's a few ways that we can manage this. Um, most commonly is to um, treat the side effect itself or to manage the um, dosing of the steroids, both of which can be adjusted quite easily. Um, so it's important to discuss any of these um, side effects or side effects that you may not know could be related to steroids um, with your, your healthcare team. A couple ways to mitigate these side effects is uh, having a consistent time at which the steroids are taken, um, trying to avoid taking it in the evening time um, to prevent insomnia, taking it with food, um, to prevent heartburn or acid reflux, uh, using medications um, that are over the counter um, or prescriptions such as omeprazole or pantoprazole um, to treat acid reflux or prevent acid reflux. Um, and then other medications to prevent some of the longer term side effects, antibiotics or antivirals to prevent infections um, and other medications that we use within the myeloma treatment realm um, to prevent the bone side effects. Uh, this is a medication that commonly requires uh, teamwork amongst a variety of healthcare groups um, as you know, patients that develop steroid-induced hyperglycemia or a high blood sugar may require um, treatments that we use within the diabetes realm that may be oral or injected. And sometimes we share that management with uh, the primary care physician or the endocrinology team. Um, and then similar, you know, working with your ophthalmologist or optometrist if any ocular side effects occur um, or with other healthcare groups. Now tying in with this um, and a very common symptom that we see in multiple myeloma is fatigue. Um, fatigue can be a presentation of the disease or a side effect from the treatment. Um, in regards to the disease, it's commonly seen, especially in those with um, anemia, low blood counts, pain, um, but all of this ties in again to both the experience and the frequency of fatigue. Um, on the treatment side, um, having insomnia from something like steroids, um, or fatigue from the treatments itself can also affect fatigue. And then this then ties in with your mental health well-being, which can um, affect the experience of fatigue as well as the um, experience or the mental health wellness at, at the time. As you can see here, several patients experience fatigue, over two-thirds of patients. However, a very small minority of those patients will actually tell their healthcare providers or their healthcare team. Um, and so it's very important, first of all, is to let your healthcare team know as soon as possible and to, um, to find you know, what might be causing it to treat the underlying cause, whether it's managing the medications, a dose reduction, um, or adequately treating the myeloma. Um, or how it ties into other medical conditions. And so that's one of the, the backbones of uh, myeloma symptom management, um, just because of how intertwined it is with both treatment, um, as well as the experience of, of the myeloma disease itself. In terms of treating fatigue, although this might be counterintuitive, um, a very effective treatment for fatigue is actually activity. So whether that's some light exercise, walking, yoga, stretching, um, that'll be very important to managing fatigue. Um, ensuring that there is a strong social support system, um, whether it's through family, friends, um, patient advocacy, or uh, online counseling groups, 
um, or even um, counseling provided through um, the healthcare system. Having um, adequate rest, so this ties into some of that steroid treatment management if uh, this is being driven by insomnia um, or side effects from the medications. Um, and then again, um, in regards to support, prayer, meditation, mindfulness uh, exercises that can reduce stress and anxiety that will then tie into uh, the management of fatigue. Um, we try to rely on this less so, but medications to treat fatigue um, or more so commonly managing the medication that um, are treating the myeloma, whether it's adjusting a dose or a schedule of a medication. Um, and then other um, mindfulness techniques, um, massage, aromatherapy, um, as indicated, and effective management of the myeloma, transfusions if um, it's a low blood count that's causing the fatigue and management of symptoms from the medications as we discussed. Now, a large portion of um, both multiple myeloma disease as well as the therapies have an effect on bone marrow function and specifically white blood cell function um, that is used to fight infection. So um, the myeloma uh, disease itself can cause uh, low blood counts just because of the crowding out of the bone marrow by myeloma or plasma cells, while the treatment can also suppress the bone marrow function and they can suppress different parts of it. So that's why with medications like the monoclonal antibodies, such as daratumumab or isotuximab, um, as well as medications like bortezomib or exosomib, that can increase the risk of things like shingles reactivation, and that requires antiviral prophylaxis, such as acyclovir or valcyclovir. Medications like steroids, as we had discussed, can increase the risk of certain types of infections, um, specifically a type of pneumonia, which can be prevented with the use of antibiotics such as Bactrim um, or others, and then the use of other antibiotics or antifungals depending on the immune function at the time. We also commonly use IVIG, which is an intravenous um, polyclonal immune globulin formulation, um, especially in patients with common uh, or with frequent uh, upper respiratory infections or pneumonias, um, along with those that may have a low IgG level at the time to help prevent further infections. What's very important in infection prevention is also remaining up to date on vaccinations. So ensuring um, you've received a seasonal flu vaccine, um, either an increased dose or the quadrivalent um, uh, increased dose vaccines available, um, ensuring you're up to date on your COVID-19 vaccine series and the most recent uh, bivalent booster, um, as that does have cross-reactivity with the um, variants that are currently seen in the community, um, ensuring things like uh, you're up to date on the pneumonia vaccine or the pneumococcal vaccine, the 20-valent pneumococcal vaccine, um, or uh, Shingrix, which is the uh, most uh, re recent shingles vaccine. Along with this is um, other methods of prevention, um, especially for COVID-19. We've seen a number of therapies uh, come and go as the variants have changed, but the tried and true methods remain, uh, remain popular. So wearing a mask and remain effective. Uh, wearing a mask, especially in crowded spaces, um, especially indoors where there's less ventilation, um, using a good quality mask, whether it's an N95, a KN95 or KF94 um, or surgical mask. Um, if, the, if you will be in a uh, indoor area for a prolonged amount of time um, and uh, you can also consider double masking. Um, some of the medications that we did have at our disposal before to prevent COVID in addition to the vaccines and um, common measures such as Evusheld um, are no longer available as they are no longer effective against the current variants in the community. And so that's why you see them crossed out here. 
Um, however, for the treatment of these infections, um, specifically for COVID, that can include uh, steroids, it can still include remdesivir, um, that can be done both inpatient or outpatient, um, or Paxlovid, which is an oral therapy, um, to an oral antiviral therapy to treat COVID, um, ideally within the first five days of symptom onset. Um, so in these cases, it's very important um, to let your healthcare team know about any infectious symptoms, fevers, cough, congestion, shortness of breath, um, low blood pressure, or um, even just fatigue or malaise that's worse than your baseline, um, having those flu-like symptoms, aches and pains um, that you may not be able to explain. Um, and then as we mentioned, in addition to wearing a mask, avoiding those crowded indoor areas, using uh, areas that have very good ventilation or um, attending outdoor gatherings, again, weather permitting, and then obviously maintaining good um, hand and personal hygiene. Now, a unique set of side effects um, that we tend to see uh, more so with the image, however, can be um, a complication of multiple myeloma itself, um, along with other cancers that carry this risk, is uh, the risk of blood clots or thromboses, um, which can prevent, it, which can present in the deep veins. That's when we refer to it as a deep vein thrombosis, or in the um, the vasculature of the lungs when we refer to it as a pulmonary edema. Um, so there's several things that can affect this risk. One is obviously a family or a personal history of blood clots um, can, again, increase the risk of a subsequent blood clot or thrombosis. Um, things like cancer itself, so multiple myeloma obviously being one of them. Um, medications such as the uh, immune modulatory, modulatory drugs, rabomid, lenalidomide, or pomelis, which is pomalidomide. Um, surgery or having um, some sedentary or uh, periods of sedentary activity, decreased activity can increase the risk of blood clots. And then um, smoking and obesity as well are known risk factors for blood clot um, development. And so this can present, if it's presenting as a, uh, a thrombosis within one of the deep veins, that can be swelling, redness, of the, uh, the extremities, tightness, um, or even just an aching pain type of sensation. Um, it can be warm to touch. Um, it can then lead to um, pain at the site or pain that's radiating. Um, if it's a uh, blood clot that has traveled to the lungs or a pulmonary embolus that can present with chest pain, um, pain with a deep breath or what we call pleuritic chest pain, pain with movement. Um, can cause shortness of breath or feeling like you can't catch your breath, anxiety, or an increased heart rate. And so the management of this um, is to immediately allow, uh, inform your healthcare team. Um, being able to diagnose this early um, is very important to the management. Um, and so that's why it's considered a medical emergency and requires immediate care. Um, in terms of the management, as we discussed previously with the immune modulatory drugs, um, we recommend patients remain on at least a baby aspirin or depending on the patient's prior history of blood clots or other medical conditions, may be on a prophylactic or full dose of an anticoagulant medication already. Um, however, if one does present with a, a DVT or a PE, that requires a blood thinner, so to speak, which we refer to as anticoagulation medications, um, most of which are oral, some of which are um, initiated on the inpatient setting or in the hospital uh, as an IV medication and then transition to oral um, or can be started as an oral medication. And some of these do require some dosing adjustments um, as time goes on. Along with that, um, for example, in uh, cases where a patient may be more sedentary or not able to move because of recent surgery or pain or other factors, um, compression stockings can help with uh, that blood flow to prevent uh, deep vein thromboses. Um, and then obviously lifestyle modifications. So maintaining activity, um, decreasing risk by uh, smoking cessation or um, weight loss. 
Now, a large proportion of patients also ex experience some form of GI discomfort through um, either uh, the course of their myeloma disease or myeloma treatment. Um, very commonly, as we said, with the immune modulatory drugs um, or uh, some of the novel drugs such as Thalonexor, we see diarrhea as a side effect from the treatment. Um, this can also be a side effect from medications we take for constipation um, or preventative uh, prophylactic medications like antibiotics or um, antidepressants. And so the treatment for this is uh, treating the underlying um, cause, which might be managing with antidiarrheal medications, uh, cholesterol, um, or things like Imodium, Lamotol, or over-the-counter antidiarrhea agents. Um, sometimes adding in a um, fiber supplement to increase binding or bulking agents, um, or obviously adjusting the, the medication that could be the culprit, um, whether that means adjusting the dose, reducing the dose, or the frequency and the scheduling of those medications. On the flip side, some of these medications can also cause constipation, um, which we commonly see as a side effect from treatment. Um, this is a very common side effect from uh, medications used for pain, or the specifically opioid pain relievers, um, and then sometimes with anti-nausea medications. Constipation, as we discussed earlier, can also be a side effect of um, the myeloma disease, especially in patients presenting with a high calcium level or that are taking high levels of calcium or iron supplements. And so managing this um, includes managing the constipation itself with uh, motility agents, stool softeners, um, reducing or uh, adjusting the medications that could be causing these side effects um, and uh, managing the supplement uh, intake as well. And then lastly, with nausea and vomiting, again, can be common to myeloma the disease um, or its treatment um, and um, can be made worse by dehydration or some supplements. And so a key here for nausea is uh, remaining very well hydrated. Um, that will decrease the experience and the uh, risk of developing nausea. Um, and then other things to manage nausea is avoiding you know, those acidic um, foods or fatty and very fried or spicy foods um, that can worsen things like acid reflux and, uh, and nausea as well. Now, a side effect from or a presentation of multiple myeloma um, can include a kidney dysfunction or renal dysfunction. Um, this can happen in a variety of ways in multiple myeloma or related disorders, um, but can also be um, affected by other organ systems. Um, so can be um, something that's affected in patients with diabetes, with heart disease or hypertension, among others. Um, and then of course, uh, can be affected by myeloma treatment or other medications. Um, so the key to kidney dysfunction and um, managing any kidney dysfunction is to hydrate as well as possible. Um, and then treating the underlying cause and managing the underlying cause to the best ability. So if it's being caused by the multiple myeloma is then treating the multiple myeloma disease itself. Most of the times with the same therapy you would be treating the myeloma with. In uh, select cases, sometimes we do use uh, plasmapheresis or other methods to try to reduce the protein or light chain burden on the kidneys that can be causing some of that kidney damage, um, but not very commonly. And then um, managing other comorbidities like diabetes, making sure the blood sugar is well controlled with either um, medications like metformin or SGL2 inhibitors versus insulin or injected medications. Um, and then managing high blood pressure or uh, cardiac function um, the heart and the kidneys uh, communicate with each other in different ways um, and can affect either function. Um, and so making sure that whether it's blood pressure or heart function that needs to be optimized, that that's done appropriately um, with us or your cardiac team. And then obviously avoiding medications that can make the kidney function worse or affect kidney function over time. 
Um, most commonly, we see that with the NSAID class medication. So things like Advil, ibuprofen, Motrin can commonly, especially if taken uh, frequently um, or chronically um, for several days at a time, um, can affect kidney function. And then things like IV contrast for cer certain imaging um, can also uh, be, uh, can affect kidney function, although commonly reversed with IV fluids. Um, and then lastly is the myeloma treatment itself. Medications like immune modulatory drugs, rapamid and pomalist are cleared by the kidneys. Um, and so sometimes it requires dose modifications of these drugs. Um, to, to ensure that the kidney function is not adversely affected. To other ways to treat and to manage kidney function are with IV fluids um, or on the inpatient and outpatient side, sometimes requires dialysis. So another common presenting sign um, with multiple myeloma um, or either at diagnosis or upon relapse is, is bone disease. As we know, myeloma can cause lytic lesions of the bone or breakdown of the bone. Um, and this can commonly present as pathological fractures, which can be painful, cause limited movement or mobility issues, um, and as well can have uh, neurological deficits, um, especially if it's close to or affecting a nerve root. Um, and so there's many ways that we can try to manage this in multiple myeloma. Um, outside of the active myeloma treatment, um, we recommend the use of bone resorptive agents or medications that can increase the strength and the density of bone. Um, there's two classes most commonly that we use, including the bisphosphonates, such as zoledronic acid or zometa or pomidronate, um, or the, another class of medications that include the rank ligand inhibitors, um, which is, encompasses Exgeva. Um, these are either um, IV or um, injected medications, respectively, that can improve bone density um, and actually work in conjunction with the multiple myeloma therapy. Um, next, we have supporting the uh, bone health is calcium and vitamin D supplements. Um, this, again, um, so it tends to go hand in hand with the bone resorptive agents to increase bone density and strength and prevent fractures in the future. In terms of managing some of the side effects from, the, from bone disease or fractures, um, we can use radiation therapy for local pain control. Um, if it's a, a vertebral fracture, something compromising the spine, um, and then we may refer to our neurosurgery colleagues for kyphoplasty um, or other therapies to strengthen the vertebrae and prevent any further nerve damage. And then ensuring that the bones remain healthy, um, commonly with weight-bearing exercise, similar to what we use for things like osteopenia or osteoporosis, so things that can strengthen those large muscle groups, whether that be you know, walking, pool-type exercises, um, yoga or Pilates. Um, this is something that if you're pursuing any other physical therapy or exercise, I would discuss with your healthcare provider um, to ensure that you're doing this in a safe environment. What goes along with this commonly, especially if we see damage to the nerves, either from the myeloma um, or from the treatment is peripheral neuropathy. This is a very common side effect that we see in our population of patients. Um, and this can present in a multitude of ways. Neuropathy can be numbness or tingling. It can be a pinprick type of sensation. It can also present with increased sensitivity to touch, um, pain or a burning type sensation, an electrical shooting type sensation, um, or issues with balance that can lead to falls or other injuries. Um, in terms of managing neuropathy, there's a multitude of ways we can manage this. Um, if it's due to the disease, and obviously it's um, treating the underlying disease. Um, however, it's also commonly due to medications that we use for multiple myeloma. Um, and so managing um, the experience of peripheral neuropathy with decreased dosing or altering the route of administration 
um, such as an, a subcutaneous injection or injection under the skin as opposed to an IV infusion um, can reduce the um, experience of, of peripheral neuropathy. There's also some uh, supplements or topical treatments that are useful. Massage with things like cocoa butter or aloe are very effective. Um, supplements including B-complex vitamins or folic acid. And then um, if that is not uh, resolving the issues, we can rely on medications to treat and prevent the worsening of neuropathy, such as gabapentin or neurontin. Uh, serotonin uh, release inhibitors such as Fimbalta, um, or novel therapies such as Lyrica. It's also important um, to keep a safe environment, so ensuring that there's, um, you know, less of a risk of tripping or falling, espe falling especially um, in the household. Um, so avoiding having excess rugs or um, areas that the uh, level of the floor can change, um, avoiding areas where wires cross in front of high traffic areas. Um, ensuring that you have um, furnishings that are off to the side or, again, not in high traffic areas that can inhibit um, movement um, and supportive shoes. The most important thing to keep in mind with peripheral neuropathy is the symptoms can sometimes be reversible. So it is very important to inform your healthcare team as soon as you notice any changes um, to avoid any permanent nerve damage as much as possible and to be able to treat the um, symptoms uh, appropriately. And so that's why it brings us into kind of the management of pain overall in myeloma. There's several things within myeloma disease as well as treatment that can lead to um, an experience of pain, whether that be from uh, the treatment itself causing neuropathic pain, the myeloma causing neuropathy, fractures that may cause bone pain, um, or medications such as growth factors um, that can also cause similar type of bone pain, or procedural pain from things like bone marrow biopsies or surgeries. Um, and pain can be something that is um, acute, so at the time of a fracture, but then can resolve with management of the fracture, um, whether it's a fixation or ensuring that it's well splinted or um, secured versus chronic pain, which we also sometimes see in the myeloma population um, due to the, the presence of bone lesions that can take a long time to heal. And obviously this can then significantly affect one's quality of life, your mobility, um, and uh, the experience of pain um, within the myeloma treatment. And so in terms of managing the several sources of pain, one is, um, like we mentioned before, our bone resorptive agents or things that can strengthen the bone, ensuring that at the time of procedures, uh, the areas that are um, uh, affected are appropriately uh, anesthetized, um, and sometimes surgical fixation or things like radiation that can treat um, and then relying on other medications that may be useful in the um, treatment of pain, such as Tylenol, um, especially since we try to avoid those NSAID class of medications um, or stronger medications like opioid medications or treatment for neuropathy. One thing to keep in mind here is that in terms of pain, um, it can significantly affect um, both your, uh, the experience and quality of life um, but also can sometimes even limit the treatment of the underlying cause. And so being able to effectively manage pain um, can only help the myeloma treatment course overall. Um, this is something that should be evaluated over time. And so as um, the myeloma is treated or other uh, complications are managed, sometimes the treatment of pain itself requires some modulation, whether it's increasing or decreasing doses um, or tapering certain medications. Um, so that's why it's very important to let your healthcare team know about any new or in, um, uncontrolled pain um, as it may be a sign of disease progression or um, a sign of inadequately treated pain at that time. Now, uh, one thing that we spoke about earlier briefly is some of the novel therapies, and these have a unique set of side effects. 
And so the T cell engaging therapies that include CAR T or bispecific therapies um, tend to present with very similar toxicity. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time to go over that specifically. In terms of CAR T, as we mentioned, it's a re-engineered T cell um, that is used to target the myeloma cells. Um, whereas a bispecific agent or bispecific T cell engager is an antibody-based therapy that targets uh, the myeloma cell and the, the native T cells within one's body. Um, the most common side effect that we see with this, along with fatigue, is cytokine release syndrome. As we mentioned, that's that inflammatory response that can happen anywhere from one to 10 days after the initiation of therapy or the infusion of the CAR T cellular product, um, and can last anywhere from one to five days, depending on the therapy being used. Um, as we discussed, this can present with fevers, chills, um, feeling uh, flu-like symptoms, fatigue or malaise, headaches, a low blood pressure, a high heart rate, um, or even feeling short of breath or require oxygen. Commonly, the treatment for this, um, which in most cases presents when the patient is in the hospital, um, would include things as IV fluids or supportive medications, such as Tylenol to bring a fever down. Um, and if more severe, then we use other um, immune therapies, such as tocilizumab or steroids to manage the cytokine release syndrome that we see. This can also present with um, neurotoxicity, as we discussed, or that immune cellular associated neurotoxicity. Um, this can occur anywhere from two to even 30 days from the time of treatment and can last anywhere from three to four days to up to several weeks. Um, this can present as headaches, a tremor, confusion, um, aphasia, which is difficulty with word finding, um, even Parkinson-like syndromes um, or uh, nerve palsies such as Bell's palsy or loss of uh, feeling or sensation in certain regions. Um, it very rarely causes any actual brain swelling, although, although this is something that we monitor, especially on the inpatient side, if we're seeing any signs of neurotoxicity. Um, these are, again, managed supportively with uh, steroids or other medications um, as needed. In addition to this, with this class of medications, we commonly see, commonly see low blood counts um, or very commonly we see infections. So that's where that infection prevention, making sure in immune um, or vaccines are up to date um, and immune function is appropriate over time is something that's monitored very clear, carefully. So really what it comes down to in symptom management in myeloma is ensuring that there is an open line of communication between yourself, your caregivers, and your healthcare team. Um, it's really important for you to tell us what's going on um, because without uh, you voicing your concerns or your experience, um, in many cases, the healthcare team may not know that that's a primary concern or a primary issue. Um, so the best thing you can do is be the, your biggest advocate, ask lots of questions, inform your healthcare providers, your healthcare team of any updates or changes as soon as they occur, um, or seek opinions from a myeloma specialist or a second opinion. Similar to this, obviously, um, you know, myeloma treatment can affect those around you as well, um, and those that are providing care and the caregivers. Um, so definitely ask for uh, resources that are available, support groups, ensuring that you're taking time for yourself as a caregiver, um, because when you're at your healthiest, that's when you can help others best. Um, so whether it's ensuring, you know, healthy friendships, um, exercise, a healthy diet, and other outlets for um, relaxation or for mental well and uh, health well-being. And we're always around um, in any situation, so please ask for help as it's needed. Thank you very much for your time.